But I thought I'd start off with a little um, tribute and, you know, a sad bit of news. Unfortunately, um, I want to rest uh, re rest in peace to uh, Fra909. That, that's, who I, that's how I know him by. Um, he's a, I'm, I'm going to basically describe him as a documentarian of the techno scene. He used to upload loads of videos on YouTube from various techno festivals all across Europe. Um, he was basically my introduction into the techno scene, to be completely honest. Like, I had no, I think, obviously I must have stumbled on maybe a mixed mag magazine or whatever or a, f a couple of RA articles, but actually seeing what a techno festival or party looked like, I see, I saw it through the lens of Fry 909 on or FR8909 on YouTube. That's the first time I ever saw anything like that. I was just like, wow, mesmerized. Like, God, oh, look at all these people, these charismatic DJs, the sounds I was hearing. Like it just like it just reverberated off your screen, and that was back in the day when the cameras weren't that great. Um, you know, most of the stuff on these channels like four eighty p lower, right? It, was, it looks like it was recorded on the Nokia thirty two ten, but <coughs> but it got across the vibe, it got across the feeling of what it must be like to be a part of that community, to be a part of that scene, and again, it just made me want to uh, do my part in it myself, right? It made me kind of want to get curious, and you know attend various warehouse braves and shoreditch and hoxton and stuff back in the day when they had warehouses around those areas um a real real legend man um and unfortunately the news came out when i'm gonna say the other day unfortunately he passed away due to cancer i think he got diagnosed pretty uh recently and it, unfortunately it was one of those cancers where it just sort of like accelerated and ended up passing away really quickly um but yeah, it's just heartbreaking, man. He left a tribute message on his Facebook page. Sort of like, uh, I think that was when he was first going into treatment for chemo. Or just before he went into chemo, he left a little message talking about um, how the treatment was going and his kind of condition at the time. And it's heartbreaking to read, man. Knowing that, of course, that a few days later he passed away. But yeah, I just want to give just, just, just a bit of a tribute to the dude, man. Just kind of go through some hits. Uh, from the YouTube channel that I thought were really, really influential and important to me at the time. I clipped something on my Twitter the other day, which I thought was a really good clip from Magda. This must have been like, I don't know, 2007 at Love Family Park. If you know anything about techno, you'll know what Love Family Park was or still is. Um, but in its heyday, sort of like in the early 90s to the early 2000s was sort of like the, the quintessential techno festival in I think Maine or Mainz, how you pronounce, how you pronounce that in Germany. Um, and if anything, it kind of, for me anyway, it was a living embodiment of what I had imagined the movie Berlin Calling was. Because I would always seen clips of Berlin Calling, but I never watched the whole thing. But I kind of got the gist of what the whole scene was like. But seeing an actual real life, kind of, through the lens of Friday 909, it really kind of brought it to life. I was like, Jesus Christ, this is amazing. I want a, I want a bit of this, right? And you always have to imagine, and I always think to myself, especially back then as well, I was like, okay, if, if festivals are essentially the lowest common the lowest form the lowest common denominator yeah or, or the lowest form of entry right to get into the scene imagine what the clubs must be like that's what i just imagine myself i was thinking okay if this is the commercial festival that's you know expansive one day festival with thousands of people coming from all over the world to go and attend with some of the biggest djs in the world you know you get flown around in private jets all this malarkey imagine what the underground warehouse events of this same caliber of, of that same sort of kind of music musical style must be like and it just kind of just it just blew my mind. I was like, okay, cool. I need to take I need to take part in this. And I think it just it must have been it must have been a couple of years after watching the videos of Fran Allen on YouTube. I took my first trip to Berlin, my first time going to Bergheim, my first time going to Cookies. Uh, was it Cookies? No, it wasn't Cookies. What was the place I went to? Was it Cookies? I don't think it was Cookies. Maybe it, maybe it was Griesmüller. My first time I went to Ber Bergheim, Griesmüller. Um, oh, actually, I went to Panorama by actually, I think on a Friday, the first time I went to Berlin, and then the following day went to Greece Munich, and then on Sunday went again back to Bergheim. That was like again my introduction into it. And I don't think I would have got it unless I watched these videos from Friday or Nine. So this is a video of Magda DJing. This is my little tribute that I put onto on Twitter that says uh, "R.I.P. to Friday Nine or Nine, original documentarian of the techno scene." Those early two thousand videos are from Love Family Park were everything to me back in the day when I started DJing. My thoughts and prayers go out to his closest family and friends. His legacy lives on. So this is an epic, epic video of Magda playing back in the day. Magda's really underrated, man. And I wonder if it was like a purposeful thing that she did. She she kind of pulled away from the scene, it feels like, right? She had a, a lot of really big tracks. 
I can remember uh, playing out and listening to a lot during that time and some really, really big remixes. But it feels like she purposely took a step back from the limelight. She didn't necessarily want to become, I don't know. I think was, this is a really bad example, but I think I imagine in my head that her and Tiny are the same sort of age range. And it feels like Tiny kind of really took a hold of that whole she really kind of stepped into the limelight. She wanted to be a bit more mainstream, right? She was doing loads of parties, doing loads of her own promotions, uh, doing all the big festivals, interviews everywhere. But Magda seemed to kind of just like, you know, take a bit of a step back. It obviously was purposeful, I imagine so, but what a great DJ she is, man. An absolute dynamite DJ. <laughs> Man, wild gift to go back to a rave right now. Look at that. Look how amazing that looks. Yeah. And I guess that's that's what probably explains my that's probably what explains my love for festivals, maybe. I'm just thinking about it now, having watched these earlier videos. Um, because this was my introduction to the scene. So I have kind of a little bit of a soft spot for festivals. Whereas most of the scene nowadays, it feels like all the cool kids kind of poo-poo festivals. They're like, oh, I don't really like festivals. They're not really a true representation of club culture. It's like, yeah, no. I never really saw a festival as um, an alternative to going to a club. It was just another thing that was part of the scene, right? Because techno music does work pretty well in this. Because I agree. I think playing techno music or playing dance music at a festival like Pat, like uh, Primavera for instance that I've been to a few times isn't necessarily the best place for it I don't think so because that crowd pro predominantly that crowd is there to see bands and rappers and singers and jazz acts whatever it may be right they're there to see live music they're not there to see like people playing behind a decks or a, p a person playing behind a decks it's not really set up the same way for it and the sparseness of the of the of the of the location of Primavera um, it just doesn't really add itself to a cog to like a really immersive experience that a festival can be but i think when you program in the right way you have in the right setting you have people there that actually understand what the music is about there's a good mix of like heads and casual listeners i think you can get something really really unique and from the festivals i've been to that have been that have smashed it i've done a really good job junction 2 being a good example i think it's a good representation of that it doesn't try to be a club outside it just it tries to be a place where they can accurately give a platform to this amazing music in an amazing setting and allow people to kind of freely move around from stage to stage i don't think that's necessarily a bad thing really in all in all intents purposes <laughs> And then the other clip that I thought was really interesting, again, I'm trying to just trace my timeline of listening to techno music back in the day, was this clip of Ricardo Villalobos. Now, this was maybe, again, another introduction of, for me, to the kind of charismatic rock star DJ, right? That um, Ricardo Villalobos was an early hero of mine in DJing, as was a person uh, like DJ Harvey, like Jeff Mills, um... It was another one I was looking at a lot back in the day. Ba, 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 ba. Do you have him? DJ Sneak, DJ Hell, good ones. That's probably it, right? But that kind of charismatic DJ, that sort of like personality behind the scene, behind the deck story, that wasn't just like, you know, morose and sort of like, you know, dull face, uh, wearing all black, just staring down at the um, at the mixer. That had to be Ricardo Villalobos. He was the first person I actually saw DJing and actually look at the crowd, right? Him and Sven Var, basically, were the ones that actually interacted with the crowd, like looked around their sort of environment. Because that's what you always hear when you start DJing, right? The first things you hear about beat matching, um, mixing, right? Whether you should not should do, you know, CDJs or fucking vinyl, tired debate. And the other thing you always hear when you're starting to DJ is the ability to read the room. I never understood in the beginning when I used to watch these, you know, industrial really kind of hard techno DJs that used to play in amazing venues they just got up and just kind of just like stared down at the mixer like like surgeon is a good example and just played never looked up to the crowd never interacted just came through and just bam 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 I was like what what is this like that don't get me wrong I'm, I get I, I know the, the the crowd must enjoy it but as a I don't know as a DJ or as a 
casual listener. I don't know. I want a bit more interaction. It's a bit. It's a bit of a show, no? There's, there should be some sort of showmanship towards the DJing part of it, right? Um, and Ricardo Villalobos is a, probably the best example of that. Like an absolute showman in the best place possible. Maybe gets a little bit too excited some in some cases, right? Sometimes let the rave get the best of him, but overall, just an, an entire legend when it comes to the ability to captivate a crowd behind the decks, which is not an easy thing to do in my um, experience as well. Let's get a little bit forward there. <laughs> this is Ricardo Vera Lobos from Love Family Park in 2010. And this was also my first introduction to like, you know, the overcrowded DJ boofing for the superstar DJs. It's a certain sort of DJ that kind of allows this. If it's a Sven Var, because he's playing vinyl, he doesn't allow anyone to come behind the decks, right? He sort of kind of has it cordoned off. Um, but the sort of superstar DJ in the in the kind of, you know, in the in the sh- in the makings of a Ricardo or Seth Troxler, they kind of feed it feels like they kind of feed off of that kind of yuppie um VIP sort of like beg friend thing behind them. They kind of feed off of it. It actually adds to their performance. Obviously for us on the other side of the crowd, we sort of a bit envious and kinda of, kinda of throw daggers at people behind there, like pretending like as if they're playing, holding their hands up, trying to G up the crowd, like their hype man, it could be a bit cringe. But there's also a bit of jealousy, like, oh, I wish we were there as well, isn't it? So that's the first time I kind of experienced that, like, seeing what that was about. And obviously seeing Ricardo, he's, like, the master of being able to, like, you know, interact with around him, throwing around air kisses, hugging randoms, wiping all his sweat everywhere. Crowd. Look at the crowd. And is it any coincidence that most of these outdoor festivals always seem to be next to a place where there's a massive motorway or bridge? I guess because those areas have loads of free space, but it's like a junction, right? There's always these festivals where there's loads of bridges and random things around, like motorways and shit. Interesting. So good. Fast forward a bit. Yeah, and of course the same look. Having a good little kiss behind the decks. You know, just living a life, man. Being an absolute rock star behind the decks. Love it. Love to see it. The showmanship of it all. The sunglasses. And then, of course, back then as well, I used to think, oh, he's wearing sunglasses to be cool. Then you go to your first festival, you have a little ping and you realise, oh, this is why people wear sunglasses, right? <laughs> your, your pupils are the size of CDs and you look like an absolute freak. So sunglasses help to give you some sort of um, uh, some sort of impression of normal normalcy, right? When it, whereas, you know, real ravers know what's going on behind those shades. <laughs> And then I think the guy with the long hair, supposedly is his manager, who happens to be Sven Vard's brother. Is that true? That's the thing you always hear in comments. Um, of course, legendary Sfra. He didn't, he didn't ever allow comments to be um, enabled on his videos. That was always a big thing. No interaction there, but hey. I'm pretty sure the long haired guy is his manager. I'm pretty sure. Let's fast forward a bit more. But legendary, man. I even still, I even still remember the uh, the little mini fridge of Red Bull behind him. That was a big time. So I remember Red Bull were, act, were basically sponsoring everything that had to do with dance music. Now they're sort of taking a bit of a step back, but you know they were obsessed with dance music, right? From the Red Bull Music Academy to the Red Bull re- lecture things they had, they were just slapping their logo everywhere. It kind of feels, even though you know, again, even though um, Boilerum is sort of like an independent startup, it feels like Boilerum sort of replaced Red Bull, right? In that kind of respect. They're sort of on the same sort of level. I'd imagine so, right? There's, they sort of represent that kind of corporate um, structure system, I think, right? Maybe some people don't want to appear on Boyroom because they're a bit naff. I don't know. Maybe. I don't know. But what an era, man. What an era. 
Look at the amount of groupies just hanging around the booth, man. This is all it's it's just such an interesting thing to witness, isn't it? Like from an outside perspective, like the the difference in approach in DJing, like this. But I guess it's, it adds to the vibe, in it. To be honest, if you ask, maybe he doesn't even care or doesn't even re realize it. But I guess it's part of the mystique. It's part of the ambiance, right? You have all these randoms behind you in the booth. You, it would be beneficial if, if you know if they're mostly girls. That helps, I guess. But just random people in the booth that kind of get up near you, and they're dancing, hanging around, being all VIPs, smoking, smoking bloody copious amounts of cigarettes, and doing all other kinds of bits of nonsense. And then it kind of gives the crowd this sort of like sense of like, wow, I wish I was there. But I don't know. Does it? Do people actually feel like that, or are they just busy dancing and having a good time? I don't know. But yeah, interesting to see. And then we'll end it with a couple more tribute to Fra. We've got a video from Ellen Allian at Kappa Future Festival, another big one in Italy. This festival is always funny for me to see from the outside in because of just the amount of dudes at this festival. Like, it's just, God damn it. There's a lot of conversations at the moment now on, on Twitter, on Techno Twitter, right? Uh, about the lack of inclusivity. <laughs> There's a lot of conversation at the moment about the lack of inclusivity in the scene, right? Um, there's not enough uh, people of colour that are playing, you know, on big lineups, on big clubs, on big festivals. But then you look at sometimes the attendance of these places, of these festivals, and these events, and you're like to yourself, hmm, there might be a reason why these promoters are being so lazy and booking the same 10, 12 people. It's because, you know, the crowd generally doesn't really change over the years. It's the same crowd. Like, look at the videos now of Kappa Future right from 2019 onwards or 2015 onwards and then it's the same like crowd disparity you know the range in terms of the people that are in the crowd is fairly similar maybe there might be a few other colors in there but for the most part it's strictly caucasian strictly european sort of looking people um nothing else apart from that so sometimes i think to myself it's a bit unfair to expect those promoters to have their finger on the pulse and know who the up and coming DJs are from, you know, outside of their little friendship group. Because to make it, you know, to be completely honest, they're just probably a little bit lazy, isn't it? Like if you're a promoter doing a festival of that scale, the last thing you need to, to, to be doing is to try to be, is trying to kind of understand what's who's next, who's bubbling up on the scene. You don't have the time. You just want to book who, you know, sells tickets, who commands a crowd, who plays well, who's no trouble to deal with. That's all you want. You just want to just, you know, you just want the easy way out. So maybe there's an option but then in the other part of it, I also get I also get the need to kind of change that narrative to sort of like sh display to the customers something there might be something they're missing out on to give them a taste of something else, right? Because if they if these festivals are book these techno originators, right, especially the guys from Detroit, then how are they meant to know where the music sort of originated from? They're not, are they? So I don't know, man. But this video is really interesting just because the amount of dudes. The amount of like pure dudes in the crowd is just nuts, mate. Watch as the camera pans across. Look at that. Just just fellas upon fellas upon fellas. Look at that crowd, mate. Just pure cock party. It's like mamma mia. <clears throat> And it'll be alright, but it was a cock party if it was an actual, you know, if it was a gay festival, but it's not. Or a queer festival, it's not. It's just a regular festival for regular cis gendered VP people and look at the look at the crowd. Look at the crowd. But again, really epic and maybe again maybe another example of what probably Junction 2's done, and especially their main stage that copy that sort of layout. Because you can see this happening in a, an absolutely at Billingsgate Market or something. We have something similar to that in London. A place called Billingsgate Market. They could do something similar to that. But it's so amazing to see. Imagine being a DJ and looking out up front and seeing that amount of people. But then I can also understand why if you're a club person, you could look at that and it could just make your balls want to shrivel up, right? And kind of tuck back into your bum. Because that doesn't represent a club to you. That's like the complete opposite of a nightclub, right? But... God, that must. I, I think everyone should. I think maybe everyone should have the ability to do that for one, once in their career. Just be able to play in front of a crowd like that, just to kind of see how it feels. Because I wonder how the sound even travels. Like, does the sound even get that far back? Like, what do they do with the speaker? Like, it's just insane. It really is insane. And how many people are actually in that crowd? Is it like a hundred thousand? Is it ten thousand? It's just mad, 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 mad. <laughs> Water a bit over here. 
And of course, Ellen Allen doing her thing. Performing behind the booth. She's another one too that doesn't really like having a lot of people behind her, it seems like, for the most part. I think it's a, to be honest, it must be a little bit of an uncomfortable thing, especially if you're a girl in the scene. It must be really weird to have loads of, because it's already annoying anyway to be in the scene, right? <laughs> to be surrounded by loads of dudes in the first place. Then to be uh, uh, to be performing somewhere and have loads of dudes that you don't know standing behind you as you play your stuff must be super uncomfortable. So it seems like for the most part, you never really see a girl in the scene have a sort of like circle loco crowd behind her in the same vein as all those guys that play at DC10. It doesn't really happen that often. But maybe the, maybe the new ones are, I don't know. But yeah, she's kind of enjoying herself there. And then a last one before we move on to the next topic. Tribute to Fra, we have a video of Seth Troxler actually playing from Fra. And again, go, go check him out, man. Like an absolute king of the scene. Fra909, that's F R A909. Check out all these videos, watch them all. It's if you really want to understand what you know what the scene's about, what festivals are about, what the techno music is about, give yourself a bit of a history lesson. Check out those videos, honestly. And then you know, do a bit of research in your own time. But some of these videos are absolutely legendary, man. Especially at the time period I sort of saw them. Let's skip forward a bit. And again, look at look at that crowd behind Seth. Look at the crowd. Just, you won't be again unless they had headphones. You won't be able to tell who was actually DJing. It's insane the amount of people there. It just make it just eesh. it's too many people for me, man. I can't do it. A couple of friends here, yeah, but look at the people. Someone's on their phone. Someone's monging off. But look at that. Look. History lesson. History. History. Two thousand and twelve, Seth. And this is back in the day when you used to use um, what do you call it? Is it, is it Serato, right? Serato box with the vinyl. You don't really see people doing that nowadays anymore. It was a big thing. It felt like in a bit, and maybe it was because people didn't want to burn CDs. Probably, is right. It's a cheap method. You 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 whack up Tractor or Serato on your laptop. You have one of those boxes that you plug in. It's a really complicated solution. You plug it into your turntables and the mixer. Then you get these bits of vinyl that will basically you use to sort of manipulate the sound, kind of like a MIDI controller, but you put them on vinyl turntables to look more legit. And it was a really big thing in the scene back in the days, let's say, in that kind of during that era, let's say early 2000s to mid 2000s, oh, yeah, early 2000s to 2010 and upwards. Like that was a thing that everyone used. And Seth was kind of one of the people that used to do it a lot. And it, I, I don't know, I just didn't like the look of it because it like using a, a MIDI controller in a club, you're always kind of on your laptop. It just looks a bit weird, isn't it? You're kind of, it always kind of disengages you from actually feeling the room and sort of kind of being at one with what you're doing. It, you always kind of constantly drag the way. And then and the other thing too that I hate about it is that you have your entire library at your fingertips when you're using a laptop, which isn't necessarily the best approach to constructing a coherent DJ set. You kind of need to constrain yourself somewhat by having a crate, having a small selection of songs, CDs, whatever it may be. So, um, but yeah, just interesting to see him using that system. Especially in this setting with so many sweaty people around, right? The needle probably warping and skipping everywhere. This is for the other yeah. There's a drink there right behind the deck. It's like, the deck is a mess, isn't it? A great hero man but yeah r.i.p from i'll end it for now but i guess a lot of djs too will be you know posting their condolences because i think he did contribute a lot to a lot of people's successes he allowed you know that again if you're when you're the first person to document that sort of stuff especially behind the booth um you know these short 10 to 12 minute clips of people playing in places again for me myself hanging you know i was a little kid watching these videos on a shitty laptop of my mum's house in custom house see those videos i was like wow man this is amazing i want to be part of this i can only imagine what it must have done for the dj's careers in terms of fans going to buy their music attending the clubs they were going to play at no just incredible man so yeah r.i.p to fra um shout out to his family and stuff and yeah you will not be forgotten my friend you will not